I'm honored to introduce to you our speaker this evening, Ms. Julia Yost. Ms. Yost is a PhD candidate in English at Yale University, where she studies Victorian poetry, and an MFA candidate in fiction at Washington University in St. Louis. She graduated from Penn State summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa, and is the recipient of numerous academic fellowships. Her critical writings on literature and culture appear in Religion and the Arts, the Victorian's Institute Journal, Commonweal, and First Things. She is the author of such provocatively titled essays as Aesthetic Aesthetics, How Gerard Manley Hopkins Found Beauty in Dogma, Comfort Food, Disordered Eating in the Terrible Sonnets of Gerard Manley Hopkins, and Fear of Children, in which she shows how the horror story The Exorcist reveals modern man's pedophobia. She also comments regularly on the Mad Men television series for First Things. In short, she covers the gamut from Blessed John Henry Cardinal Newman to Don Draper. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Julia Yost. Thank you. In 1918, the poems of Gerard Manley Hopkins were published for the first time. Hopkins had been dead by then for 30 years. He'd been unknown during his own lifetime because the Victorians had not known what to do with a poet who composed according to this rule. Meaning may be dark at first, but once made out, it should explode. So Hopkins' poetry exploded at the end of the Great War. Between the World Wars, the literary avant-garde, the so-called modernists, looked back and down on the Victorians. They remembered Robert Browning, the ultra-Victorian poet who had penned these lines, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world, which now seemed such a damning expression of Victorian complacency. Look around at the trenches, at the making and destruction of nations. The providential cosmos of the Victorians was defunct, and so were the conventional harmonies of Victorian poetry. The new slogan was, make it new and make way for the experimental fragmentary works of a Pound, an Eliot, a Joyce, a Stein, the literary modernists. That's modernist with a capital M. This is the self-congratulatory variant on the word modern. We're more modern than modernity, so we get the ist. We made modern our, modern our thing, so we get the capital M. Now, what is Hopkins doing in this crowd? Hopkins is the one honorary modernist among the Victorians, and if you know anything about him, he seems absolutely the unlikeliest. In every way except poetically, Hopkins had been backward looking even among the Victorians. He was a Jesuit, so he believed dogmatically in Catholic verities, which the Victorians were modern enough to despise. And he had come to his dogma through the Oxford movement, that quixotic Anglican project setting its face against modernity. And he certainly believed in providence. He believed that God was in his heaven. But Hopkins also believed, verily thou art a God that hidest thyself. He did not go in for the obvious visible providence of steam engines and telegraph wires and the march of the British Empire, which makes the Victorians seem so complacent in retrospect. His outlook was a lot like that of John Henry Newman, who had preceded him in the Oxford to Rome conversion and baptized him as a Catholic. Newman wrote stunningly, I look out of myself into the world of men, and there I see a sight which fills me with unspeakable distress. The world seems simply to give the lie to that great truth that God exerts a providential care over his creatures. On the one hand, this is not a modern insight. It's the doctrine of the fall. On the other hand, it feels very modern, this existential angst because God has abandoned the earth. Newman wrote this in 1864, but any soldier might have written it in a letter from the trenches during the Great War. And Hopkins and Newman then asked a question that still seems worth asking. What's a religious poet to do? What kind of religious poetry will be true to experience in a world that gives the lie to the truths of providence? And what they came up with looks a lot like literary modernism in terms of technique. They said, let's collapse conventions of poetry, of grammar, of English generally, but not because the old dogmas are defunct, 
Rather, because the old dogmas still hold in spite of appearances, if we make readers look beyond their first reading for poetic meanings and harmonies that are obscure, then this meaning may explode that the truths of providence are likewise obscure, but they still obtain, that there is design amid the chaos. Mashing up modernism with St. Augustine, their, poem, their slogan might have been, um, for truth ever ancient, poetry ever new. We have to rewind a bit to the Oxford movement. Um, about the word modern, in its lowercase form, it of course just means whatever happens to be happening right now. Every age thinks it's the most modern thing going while it's going. The Victorians certainly thought this about themselves. So when the Oxford movement mounts a critique of modernity, its target is Victorian modernity, which doesn't mean that the critique is passe. Year zero for the Oxford movement is 1833. Newman at this time was an Anglican clergyman and a don squirreled away in Oriel College, Oxford. One day, one don said to the other, have you noticed that Christians are becoming very liberal these days? We should do something about that. Liberalism with a capital L was the enemy, and Newman defined liberalism as the anti-dogmatic principle. A modern principle, he thought, is modernity entails hostility to dogma of any kind. Interrogate everything, take nothing on faith. These imperatives are very compelling in the age of the steam engine or the jet engine or the search engine, which is why Sherlock Holmes was such a star of the Victorian age and remains a star of the information age. He embodies this ideal of anti-dogmatic reasoning. Um, he makes no assumptions. It's a shocking habit, he tells Watson. And this ideal in him, tellingly, is atheistic. Religious dogma was not to be spared. All the eminent Victorians were agreed on this point. George Eliot wrote novel after novel, predicating an ethics on a religion of humanity, influenced by Feuerbach's humanistic work, The Essence of Christianity, which Eliot had translated influentially from the German. Spoiler, dogma is not of the essence of Christianity. So against this prevalent anti-dogmatism, the Oxford movement arose to reconstruct the Church of England as Anglo-Catholic rather than Anglo-Protestant, and crucially as dogmatic. On your handout is a punch cartoon from 1850, which gives you a sense of what the mainstream Victorians thought about Catholic dogmatism, Anglo or Roman. The bald gentleman you see is Mr. Punch, the magazine's mascot. Um, and also a kind of national mascot, the representative Victorian gent. He's paid a visit by the two most illustrious papists of the day, Cardinal Wiseman, the fat fellow, and Father Newman, post-conversion, holding up the cardinal's train. Though here they're called wise boy and new boy because, I don't know, that's clever. Um, the cardinal's <laughs> delivering a papal bull, of which Mr. Punch is plainly skeptical, while his Irish maid goes down on her knees. The cartoonist is having fun with visual fripperies, with the cardinal's galero and capamagna, Newman's beretta, all the ritualistic vesture that offended the plainer style of Victorian churchiness. But another target of the critique is Catholic dogma, which the Victorians considered just as extraneous as the sartorial trimmings. Dogma is here represented by the bull, the kind of document by which, for example, Pius IX would define the Immaculate Conception in 1854, much to the disgust of the Victorians. Your immaculate conceptions, your assumptions, your real presences, all of these things are dogmatic accretions to the plain essence of Christianity. The Catholic convert W.G. Ward liked to say that he would welcome a new papal bull with his times at breakfast every morning. Not so, Mr. Punch. The Catholic appetite for dogma was shocking to plain English notions. Those are the words of Newman's nemesis, the liberal clergyman Charles Kingsley. And that phrase, plain English notions, is so revealing. The Victorians felt that your notions, your beliefs, should be plain. They should be uncomplicated, plain and simple. And they should be clearly true, plain to see. And then you should have no problem putting them in plain English with no tricks of rhetoric or tricks of logic, no bull. Anyone who believed the Catholic bull 
was superstitious, like Mr. Punch's Irish Maid, or sophistical, like Newman and the Oxford Movement. Either way, shocking to plain English notions. There is actually a shocking or provocative aspect to the rhetoric of the Oxford Movement, which is not often enough appreciated. One of Newman's friends, Richard Hurl Froude, put it this way, now that one is a radical, there's no use in being nice. Newman agreed. In one of the very first tracts of the movement, he wrote, black event as it would be for the country, yet we cannot imagine the English bishops a more blessed termination of their course than the spoiling of their goods and martyrdom, which is doctrinally an impeccable sentiment. And in the same style, Froude liked to say of Thomas Cranmer, the great Anglo-Protestant martyr, the only good I know of him is that he burned well. I think the idea was that if you could shock or provoke the right kinds of people, you would know that you were on the side of truth. Newman later wrote, I used irony in conversation when matter-of-fact men would not see what I meant. Newman had no patience for matter-of-fact men, not just because they didn't get his jokes, but because they would never be dogmatists. They expected the truth to be very plain. Newman tended to feel that the truth was not plain, Newman's sense was that if we are to believe in God at all, we will have to believe contrary to the plain sense of the things that we see. This conviction allowed him to swallow a lot of dogma, and it had an effect on his rhetoric. Newman has very little use for plain English. In his prose, his meaning is often difficult to pin down, at least to the extent of eliminating ambiguities. And in poetry, his finest moments are those at which his meaning is not plain, um, but dark at a first reading and explodes upon a closer look. Newman is more admired for his prose than for his poetry, and I'm not here to change that. Um, Newman's prose at its finest is simply the finest prose ever written in English. Um, and he wrote a lot of it. He wrote a lot less poetry. Of the poetry that he did write, some of it is really good. By my count, exactly... 46 lines of it are really good. <laughs> and I'm going to show you all 46. <laughs> Not just because they're really good, but because they're important to Hopkins, Newman's theological protege and a far greater poet who was able to do more with the formal innovations than Newman ever could. So all 46 lines appear in The Dream of Gerontius, which is a long narrative poem that Newman wrote in 1865. In this poem, an old man named Gerontius expires, surrounded by a priest and attendants who administer the rites for him. The deathbed scene is in the first section of the poem, and then you have another six sections in which the soul of Gerontius floats toward purgatory and poses questions to its guardian angel. And that part of the poem is gripping for theologians. It's very boring for literary critics, so we're not going to look at it. All the really good lines are in the first section. <coughs> so they come in Gerontius two major speeches from his deathbed. We'll start with his opening speech, which is on page two of your handout. I'm just going to read what's underlined here. Um, you can read the rest on your own time. I recommend it. So here's Gerontius describing what it's like to face physical death. Tis this new feeling, never felt before, that I am going, that I am no more. Tis this strange innermost abandonment, this emptying out of each constituent and natural force by which I come to be. Tis death, O oh loving friends, your prayers, tis he. As though my very being had given way, as though I was no more a substance now, and could fall back on naught to be my stay, and turn no whither but must needs decay, and drop from out the universal frame into that shapeless, scopeless, blank abyss, that utter nothingness of which I came. This is it that has come to pass in me. At a first reading, this passage seems fairly conventional. It's in iambic pentameter. Um, which is familiar to anyone who read Shakespeare in high school. Every line has five iambic feet. An iambic foot is a pair of syllables, the first unstressed, the second stressed. So, tis this new feeling never felt before. Iambic pentameter is the most common meter in English because it approximates the natural rhythms of English speech. And Newman uses it here very naturally. You don't have to wrench the words to fit the meter. Tis this new feeling never felt before. 
It's very well done. The rhyme scheme is also quite conventional, or at least it starts off that way. The basic scheme is ABAB, CDCD, and so on, or in my color coding, blue, red, blue, red, purple, green, purple, green. I did this so you can follow along. Come with me down the rhymes from the top. Death, now, breath, brow. Pray for me before, extremity, no more. Abandonment, the constituent, be. Visitant, my door, and to daunt, before. Then something weird happens. In line 17, tis death. O oh, loving friends, your prayers, tis he. He should be the A rhyme in four lines rhyming A, B, A, B, but it's not. Nothing in the next three lines rhymes with he. Maybe he is supposed to rhyme with the and be up in lines 10 and 12, but if so, that's a departure from the scheme. It's as if something about this line didn't fit the scheme, disrupted it, as if something here can't be harmonized. After this line, we return to the pattern A, B, A, B, with way, now, stay, thou. But starting in line 22, things get weird again. Decay, frame, abyss came. Decay doesn't rhyme with abyss. Maybe it's supposed to rhyme with way and stay up in lines 18 and 20, but again, that breaks the pattern. We close out with me, this, pray, what? Maybe this rhymes with abyss. Maybe me rhymes with the and be and he and pray rhymes with decay and way and stay, but there's no proper scheme here. Everything actually does rhyme, but it rhymes randomly. Something happened here at the end. The rhyme scheme, the conventional harmony, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, broke down. The form of the poem started to resemble that shapeless, scopeless, blank abyss. There may even be a pun on blank here because blank verse is unrhymed verse. What caused this breakdown? Death showed up. In line 17, which ends on an ellipsis, giving a sense of disruption, fragmentation, something broken off, Newman is making the form of the verse imitate the form of the dying man. If Gerontius is collapsing, so is his poem. It gets worse. 80 lines later, Gerontius has another collapse, the final one, and gives another speech. This one is iambic, but it's not pentameter. The lines are pretty ragged. And the rhyme scheme, we'll see if you can figure it out. Page three of the handout. I can no more, for now it comes again. That sense of ruin which is worse than pain. That masterful negation and collapse of all that makes me man as though I bent over the dizzy brink of some sheer infinite descent, or worse, as though down, down forever, I was falling through the solid framework of created things, and needs must sink and sink into the vast abyss. And crueler still, a fierce and restless fright begins to fill the mansion of my soul, and worse and worse, some bodily form of ill floats on the wind, with many a loathsome curse tainting the hallowed air, and laughs and flaps its hideous wings, and makes me wild with horror and dismay. O oh, Jesu, help! Pray for me, Mary, pray. Rhyme scheme. We start with a couplet, again and pain, which rhymes better for Newman than for us because he was English from England. Um, then there's another couplet in lines 18 and 118 and 119 with still and fill. Then you've got dismay and pray in 125, 126. Otherwise, give or take a slant rhyme. It's chaos. Unless it's not. You have to look closely. But the last word of every line is rhymed at least once by the last word of some other line somewhere in the stanza. It's just the order of the rhymes that's completely random. So collapse in 110 gets flaps 13 lines later. Bent in 111 has descent in 113. Brink in 112 has sink in 117, and so on. What was true of the, open, of the end of that opening speech is even more true here. This is a rhyme scheme, but it's a paradoxical one. It's designed to look chaotic. With this artful disorder, Newman suggests that a designing hand is at work, even when its works are not plain. At a first reading, these are the speeches of a man undergoing a masterful negation and collapse, abandoned by both God and the poet. Physical form and poetic form are falling apart. But look closer. There is a design, 
it's going to look like chaos to those expecting something simpler and more obvious, something more like plain English or conventional poetry. In fact, I appear to be literally the first person ever to figure out the rhyme scheme in these passages. That's the downside to this strategy. But there is a scheme. Gerontius Maker put one in, and the upside is when you find it, it's explosive. That's Maker with a capital M. But there's also the maker as in the poet. If you know the etymology, um, poet comes from the, from the Greek from maker. The parallel of God and poet is not aggrandizing to Newman. It's just instructively microcosmic. Even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Even the very syllables of your dying speech are all rhymed. The conventions of poetry, iambic pentameter, the rhyme scheme ABAB, have collapsed here, but with this purpose, to imitate the designs of providence, in which what looks chaotic at a first reading is obscurely harmonious. That's how Newman makes it new. Now we've arrived at Hopkins, who has an eye for the obscure designs of providence and no use at all for plain English, at least not in his poetry. Here's a typical passage from his journals. Stepped into a barn where the hay had been stacked on either side and looking at the great rudely arched timber frames, I thought how sadly the beauty of Inscape was unknown and hidden and buried away from simple people, and yet how near at hand it was if they had eyes to see. Hopkins' simple people are a lot like Newman's matter-of-fact men. Hopkins was an undergraduate at Oxford in the 1860s, part of the second generation of the Oxford movement, and like many young men in that crowd, he ended up following Newman to Rome. I'm going to suggest briefly why the Oxford movement would have resonated with Hopkins and his quirky poetics. So if you're Mr. and Mrs. Hopkins, and you're worried that your son Gerard is making the wrong kind of friends at Oxford, here's something you don't want to find in his diary. Evidence that he's turning ascetic. While he was in college, Hopkins participated in the revival of Catholic asceticism, which was one project of the Oxford movement. Um, the mortifications that he recorded in his journals have earned him a reputation as a Freudian head case. But see what you think. January 1866. For Lent, no puddings on Sundays. No tea except if to keep me awake, and then without sugar. Meat only once a day. No verses in Passion Week or on Fridays. No lunch or meat on Fridays. Not to sit in armchair except can work in no other way. <laughs> Hopkins' asceticism was mostly of this sort, the offering up of minor privations. It's very standard Catholic piety and very typical of the Oxford movement. Hopkins is following the example of an earlier figure in the movement, Richard Hurl Froude, whom I had quoted earlier on Thomas Cranmer and Burning. Froude was sort of the golden young man of the movement. He died of tuberculosis in 1836, and tuber tuberculosis was sort of a spiritual way to go. It was the poet's disease. <laughs> His diaries were published two years later, and they were very polarizing. They depicted an ascetic discipline um, that quickly became the pattern for ardent young men turning Catholic, but it also horrified the rest of Britain, showing everyone how far outside the mainstream the Oxford movement had gone. Very shocking to plain English notions. To be clear, what bothered the Victorians was not that Froude was shown scourging himself with a flail or copying to really lurid papist sins. Rather, that for page after page, he was shown hyper-focusing on trivia. So one day, he meant to have kept a fast and did abstain from dinner, but at tea ate buttered toast. And this strikes him as a momentous fall from grace. He condemns himself again and again for letting his mind wander at prayers, for dealing brusquely with a friend, for being ashamed to have it known that I had no gloves, for feeling a grotesque desire to affect a gentleman-like carelessness about his umbrella, and for looking with greediness to see if there was a goose on the table for dinner. I think it was Fulton Sheen who said that hearing nuns' confessions was like being stoned to death with popcorn. <laughs> The Victorians were much less good-humored in their responses to Froude. 
they did not get the sensitivity of his conscience. The critic Sir James Stephen, who is Virginia Woolf's grandfather, incidentally, spoke for many when he characterized Froude as morbid. His introverted gaze analyzes with elaborate minuteness the various motives and with perverted sagacity pursues the self-examination. The men of Oxford must be feeble indeed and emasculate to be so scrupulous. Hopkins' confessional diaries are similar to Froude's and they've been delegitimized in similar terms, though Hopkins' critics have access to a psychodiagnostic framework that Froude's did not. So we find Hopkins scrupling over such offenses as talking lightly about Millet, a great Victorian painter, killing a spider, and intemperance at dessert. His later editor, Norman Mackenzie, says he's talking about taking perhaps a second candied pear. <laughs> and a lot, of, a lot of scholars will tell you that Hopkins was neurotic. He was a closeted homosexual. He was anorexic. He was whatever. <clears throat> Regarding that spider, Mackenzie commends Hopkins' sensitivity to creatures to whom little attention was then paid. Hopkins is very sensitive to things to which little attention is commonly paid. He had a theological argument for this. He wrote, I think that the trivialness of life is done away with by the incarnation. Our Lord submitted not only to the pains of life, the fasting, scourging, crucifixion, etc., but also to the mean and trivial accidents of humanity. Nothing in human life need be trivial since the word has been made flesh. All the pains of life, all the mean and trivial accidents can add up to an imitation of Christ. Everything and every action matters because God has designed and has his eye on absolutely everything, even or especially the small stuff. This is an ascetic sensibility. It's also a poetic sensibility. Listen to this passage from Froude. Merton Bell began to go, and it struck me, I cannot tell why, that if such a trifle as that could give me such a vivid idea, my soul must be a most intricate thing. Froude was seeking the extraordinary within the ordinary. He said he wanted a common sense romance. Hopkins, ditto. Hopkins' specialty is the discovery of providence amid what looks like disorder. All the world is full of inscape, and chance, left free to act, falls into an order as well as purpose. Looking out of my window, I caught it in random clods and broken heaps of snow. His journals record unlikely forms of meaning and beauty and significance. Some are very unlikely. The slate slabs of the urinals, even, are frosted in graceful sprays. He looks past, he looks past the first reading. He looks closely at trifles, at things to which little attention is commonly paid, in the confidence that everything is designed by God and overseen by him. This meaning explodes, that in the light of providence, everything is made new. This is a Hopkinsian vision, classically, what critics call it. And it really comes out in the nature sonnets of the 1870s, which Hopkins wrote in Wales and other rustic locales. In these poems, there lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. There is order as well as purpose to every random thing in creation. Hence the hymns to graceless growth, to wildness and wet to March Bloom and May Mess, and up in the sky, what lovely behavior of silk sack clouds has wilder, willful wave your meal drift molded ever and melted across skies, and so on. Hopkins is stressing the many strange forms of God's designing, how odd it is that God has intended that graceless growth, those random clods and broken heaps of experience. This stress produces Hopkins' famous verbal quirks, his alliteration, wildness and wet, and nonce compounds, silk sack, willful wavier, daring infelicities, may mess, lovely behavior, show how an eye for providence may inspire unorthodox poetry. But what happens when we take Hopkins out of the sweet, especial countryside and put him in the dirty modern city? In 1884, Hopkins' Jesuit superiors posted him to the Catholic University in Dublin, a joyless place full of rats and Irish people 
<laughs> and colleagues who thought him more or less crazy. The result was the so-called terrible sonnets in which it seems that Hopkins fails to find order and purpose in the random clods and broken heaps of his experience. Life is pointless. Why must disappointment all I endeavor end? One sonnet concludes, all life death does end and each day dies with sleep. If Newman wrote great poetry about a physical collapse, Hopkins is going to write great poetry about a psychological crack up. We'll see that Hopkins, like Newman, finds ways of collapsing the form of his poetry, producing an artful disorder. Whether he, like Newman, intends for that disorder to imitate the designs of providence is a question that still divides critics. Stand by. Start with a dark one. They're all dark. To seem the stranger describes Hopkins' failure and loneliness in Dublin. Actually, they all do, but this is on the back page of the handout. Um, I'm going to read just the first stanza. To seem the stranger lies my lot, my life among strangers. Father and mother dear, brothers and sisters are in Christ not near, and he my peace, my parting, sword and strife. England, whose honor, oh, all my heart woos, wife to my creating thought, would neither hear me were I pleading, Plead nor do I, I weary of idle a being, but by where wars are rife. That sound you heard was his vocation collapsing, partly his poetic vocation, his creating thought, his muse has abandoned him, but also his priestly vocation. Look at lines seven and eight, I weary of idle a being, but by where wars are rife. Literally, he's talking about the political tension between England, whose honor, oh, all my heart woos, and rebellious Ireland. But he's also complaining that he, a Jesuit foot soldier, never manages to do anything heroic for Christ. His identity as militant priest and poet has collapsed. So accordingly, his language collapses. Grammar, syntax, even morphology. Weary is split between two lines, weir hyphen line break E. I read this and my first thought is, you can't do that. <laughs> and my second thought is, Hopkins can do that. It's so audacious and so vulnerable. Hopkins is so weary of his task, so uncertain that his task is worth doing or that he's the one to do it, he collapses in the middle of the word. In line eight, he just lets it go. The phrase weary of idle being is gibberish. I think it means that Hopkins is weary of being an idle being, but one of the beings is missing. Is it the participle or the noun? Hard to say. In the confusion, I think that the word idle tends to read ambiguously as both an adjective and a noun. That's my impression. Whatever part of speech it is, this is what Hopkins is saying at this point that he is. He can't even claim a real noun for himself. He's become a mere condition, just idle a being without energy or purpose or will. Total collapse. <coughs> That's bad news. But it's good poetry. We can't parse the grammar, but we get Hopkins all the more powerfully here because it's a muddle and he's a muddle. If these lines were in plain English, they wouldn't be nearly so affecting. The gibberish is articulate. As in Gerontius, the disorder is designed. There's a poetic intention amid the rubble. But is there a divine intention? Will Hopkins draw a parallel between the eye of the poet and the eye of God, between the designs of the poem and the designs of providence. I don't see him doing it in this sonnet. And there are many critics who will tell you they don't see him doing it anywhere in the terrible sonnets. That at this point, Hopkins has become truly modern and lost his faith. Let's look at what I consider the greatest of the terrible sonnets, a dense, intense number called Carry and Comfort. We join Hopkins here at his lowest point. He's tempted by despair with a capital D, and he's contemplating suicide. You'll see he decides against it. Pay attention to why. Not 
I'll not carry in comfort, despair, not feast on thee, not untwist, slack they may be, these last strands of man in me, or most weary cry, I can no more. I can, can something, hope, wish day come, not choose not to be. But ah, but O oh, thou terrible, why wouldst thou root on me thy ring world right foot rock? Lay a lion limb against me, scan with darksome devouring eyes my bruised bones, and fan, O oh, in turns of tempest, me heaped there, me frantic to avoid thee and flee? Why? That my chaff might fly, my grain lie sheer and clear, Nay, in all that toil, that coil, since seems I kissed the rod, hand rather, my heart low, lapsed strength, stole joy, would laugh, cheer. Cheer whom, though? The hero whose heaven-handling flung me, foot trod me, or me that fought him? A oh, which one? Is it each one? That night, that year, of now done darkness, I, wretch, lay wrestling with my God, my God. So what just happened? In the first four lines, Hopkins refuses to commit suicide. He says, I'll not, blah, blah, blah. Most weary cry, I can no more. There's that word again, weary. Here, as before, it precedes a collapse, grammatical collapse, in that italicized phrase. Can is a modal verb. I can see, I can do, I can talk, I can jump. Can can't stand on its own. The phrase is gibberish, but it's articulate gibberish of a sort that we've come to recognize. If Hopkins were to cry, I can no more, it would be because he had collapsed psychologically, even to the point of welcoming physical death, that masterful negation and collapse that Newman describes so well. He refuses to collapse. Then in lines five through eight, he says, now that that's out of the way, why? <laughs> why is my life nothing but pain? Stands a break, line nine, answer. All that suffering had a purpose. It purged my chaff. That's providence. And note how line nine takes this idea of collapse, of dispersal, disorder, and redeems it. The winnowing fan scatters things, but with divine intention that my chaff might fly, my grain lie sheer and clear, revealing finally, making clear finally the designs of providence. Then the rest of the stanza elaborates Hopkins' reappraisal of his dark night, leading up to this really extraordinary conclusion which makes brilliant use of parentheses, of all things. <laughs> That night, that year, of now done darkness, I, wretch, lay wrestling with my God, in parentheses with an exclamation point, my God. <coughs> the metaphor is a recognition in the morning with reference to Jacob's wrestling with the angel and less directly the road to Emmaus. Now that Hopkins sees providence in his suffering, he's able to recognize God anew as a friendly combatant, testing him through adversity. The parentheses are ingenious. My God, exclamation point, is the my God of sudden recognition. It's put in parentheses because parentheses signal the addition of supplementary material. They bring the process of reappraisal, of revision into the finished work. And the moment of my God, exclamation point, is very much a moment of revision, literally re-seeing. It's an explosive device. It's a little hand grenade. But where is Newman in this poem? Some of you may have caught it in line three. I'll not, blah, 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 most weary cry, in italics, I can no more. The italics are a direct quotation from Gerontius. Remember the second deathbed speech, I can no more, for now it comes again, that sense of ruin which is worse than pain, that masterful negation and collapse of all that makes me man. Hopkins is saying, I've read that poem. I know those lines, I will not speak them. I will not untwist these last strands of man in me, all that makes me man. I will not cry, I can no more. Some critics think that Hopkins is rebuking Newman here, that he's saying, when faced with death, don't ever yield. Geronti's got it wrong. 
I don't think that's right. An old man yielding to natural death is not the same as a young man tempted by unnatural death. I think Hopkins quotes Newman here because he's picked up from Newman and uses again and again in the terrible sonnets this device, grammatical collapse as an emblem of the disorder that gives the lie to the great truths of providence. And he develops this device in a way that we might be able to say distinguishes him from some of the literary modernists with whom he's grouped. For a modernist who's making it new for the sake of the new and not in light of old dogmas, it might be enough to give artistic expression to collapse, enough to make gibberish articulate. Hopkins wants to find the verb that comes after can. I can something, hope, not choose not to be. But that's not the answer, that's the question. It looks back to Hamlet, it looks forward to Albert Camus who said, modern life being as absurd as it is, there's only one really serious philosophical question, and that is suicide. To that question, Hopkins has already answered, not, I'll not, and not because God's in his heaven, all's right with the world, rather because, my God, exclamation point, even in Dublin, the slate slabs of the urinals are frosted in graceful sprays. What can we? We can look past that disordered first reading until providence, dark at first, explodes in revision. Hopkins died in 1889 of typhus. He died one year before Newman, though he was half Newman's age. He was obscure, still 30 years before the moment when readers of English poetry would cry, my God, exclamation point, that Jesuit was some poet. On his deathbed, he still did not cry, I can no more. He is said to have said, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Since Hopkins left it there, I will too. Thank you.